And we are, as a people, inherently and historically Wake up. opposed to secret societies, the Se- secret oaths, and the secret proceedings. The show that asks questions about why we don't ask questions. What the hell is going on? This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. These are Conspiracy Queries. I am Alan Park. Last week, when I last spoke with you, uh, I had an update on Steve Finney. He was the um, gentleman from uh, Kitchener area. And uh, listen to that show. Go to the website, conspiracyqueries.com, and catch up. I can't do a whole show and this show. But basically, uh, Steve uh, was in trouble with the courts, and uh, the courts were telling him to disassociate himself uh, with um, with his organization, and yet he is out, and uh, the international intervention has freed Canadian prisoner of conscience Steve Finney. Basically, uh, the international community telling the local judge um, that uh, Michael Cuthbertson, if you want to Google him and maybe send him a pizza with anchovies on it, that he had told Steve Finney he would not be released on bail unless he formally renounced his involvement with his uh, association, the ITCCS. And basically the international uh, society is uh, the international forces. I guess they're talking about the UN is going to be taking a pretty hard look at this case. And hopefully maybe that judge can we can just add one more to the unemployment files, and that'll be okay if it's that judge who was wrong and is often wrong, and his organization and corporation are often wrong. And it's good that we start to get these little victories. They're important for us humans. And I say humans because the Russian prime minister has confirmed the existence of intelligent extraterrestrial life. This comes from the Collective Evolution website. Russia's prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev, recently confirmed the existence of intelligent extraterrestrial life in a short interview where the greys were standing behind him pointing phasers at his head and uh, it was away from network cameras. Uh, This is an extremely significant yet rare occasion when a current serving prime minister of any nation comes forward to share the truth or what this website says is the truth. Um, Anyway, that's Medvedev for you. I don't know if... um, Putin is going to be okay with that kind of information. He's got his hands full with the Olympics in Sochi, spending the the billions there to to keep the gay people away. No gay Olympics in Sochi. Be interesting to see how that unfolds later on. Hey, folks, got a great guest on the show today, and um, we're going to be talking about the lack of government, the lack of funding for government, the government shutdown, whatever you want to call it. One of the effects of the government shutdown is a major foodborne illness outbreak. This is from the website Wired.com. Pretty mainstream stuff, good website. Late breaking news that the government is shut down, but food safety personnel and disease detectives have been sent home and forbidden to work. And consequently, a major foodborne illness has begun. The Food Safety and Inspection Service of the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, announced that an estimated 278 illnesses reported in 18 states have been caused by chicken contaminated with salmonella, salmonella Heidelberg, and possibly produced by the firm Foster Farms. Not to point any fingers, but uh, need to get those inspectors back on the job so that people can eat and we need to get uh, those inspectors their salaries back, unlike the uh, folks in the government who have actually decided to uh, pay themselves. No problem there. There's a government shutdown. What does it all mean? How will we dig ourselves out of this hole, and why are we in it? For answers to this and even more questions, let's go to our interview. Our guest on the show today is a journalist. An investigative journalist. I know that might sound hard to believe. That's like booking a pterodactyl on the show. You mean they still exist? Yes. <laughs> Not every news purveyor out there is spewing corporate-issued pablum. 
Suzanne Posel is indeed an investigative journalist and the chief editor of the Information Stuffed OccupyCorporatism.com. Suzanne's story-gathering skills bring to our attention certain narratives highlighting the pattern of globalization in commerce and money markets and the political scene and how that affects Americans and, in fact, the entire world. Suzanne will discuss with us today some of the trickery used to lead us humans of this planet into a compliant state, even though it seems to accept the coercive desires of the ruling elite. Hey, I know a lot of people don't like that word, elite, but when they have caused as much damage through rampant money market manipulation, and none of them seem to, as a result, have seen any hard prison time, except Iceland, I'm okay with calling them the elite. Just know that my intention behind that term is not at all congratulatory or respectful, but rather disparaging. So here she is to talk about all that. Suzanne Posel, thank you for coming on the show. Wow, that's an incredible introduction. I've had a lot of them. That is an incredible one. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. (laughs) You're welcome. I've been uh, reading your website for a while, OccupyCorporatism.com, and it is information-packed. There's no better way for me to to put that out there. Um, Are you alive down there? There's a government shutdown happening in the States. Uh, Yes, I I am alive. There is a um, a, uh, manufactured prepackaged protest that's about to start um, in a couple of days. And I am uh, fervently trying to explain to people that you have to make sure that when you're protesting, you're actually protesting and not feeding the system. But it seems to be falling on deaf ears. I'm like Cassandra in the Greek myth. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting you bring that up because your website, Occupy Corporatism, there have been uh, several criticisms of the original Occupy movement of a while ago that it was also uh, either ineffective or co-opted. How did you oh. wind up uh, getting that name for your website? And what are the Well, I just felt that... Uh, the occupation of corporate corporatism is part of the major problem. It's part of how they control us through corporatization. All of our cities and states and countries are corporations. Um, we have uh, social security numbers. We're employees of the corporation. And so I felt that uh, through corporatism, we could shut down at least half of their operation if we wanted to and then deal with the other half. <laughs> okay, so what is this protest that's coming up that you're you're trying to make sure uh, goes the right way? The uh, ride for the Constitution, the truckers. Uh, oh, the truckers shut down. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, so what what is their? Uh, haven't been right up on this one to the minute. What is their uh, particular angle here, and and how does that concern you as perhaps being mistake filled? Well. The shutdown is to gas up your car to drive to D.C. to protest the price of gas. Now, a normal, logical person would say, you don't have to say any more, Suzanne, I get that. You can't protest the price of gas by gassing up your car. However, it seems that I have to elaborate on that to most people and explain to them that if 100,000 participants go to this protest at $80 to fill up each tank. If they only fill up their tank once, that's $7.2 million to the oil companies that they're protesting against. Most people are going to gas up more than once. If they gas up twice at 100,000 participants at $80 uh, to fill up their tank, that would be $14.4 million to the oil companies. Every time they swipe their card to pay for their gas or anything else, that would be a minimum of two hundred and forty thousand dollars to the credit card companies. Okay, so I'm and guessing <laughs> I'm guessing you're not you're not suggesting that the remedy then is to carpool. Uh, what what uh, <laughs> what better way? Are, four truckers in way. one truck that would be a party. How how are you uh, trying to advise them to to be more effective with this particular? Um, because their message, you, you, you see, they're trying to get some kind of message out. Sure, uh, you're just. How how better can they point the it? Is. Yeah, don't <laughs> drive around and... Well, if you're going to protest the price of gas, why would you fill up your gas tank? Yeah. Better to have a, <laughs> a don't buy sense. gas 
Don't buy gas don't day buy at all. Gas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. All right. So um, what I, what what are the other effects, and how might long uh, how how long might it last this uh, shutdown, and what are the what are the real effects of it versus um, the effects that say John Boehner is talking about, or uh, some of these other pointy head people who seem to think that they know what they're doing but clearly don't. Well, with this particular protest, they not only want you to put it, put seven point two million dollars into the hands of the bank of the uh, the oil companies, but they also want no one to buy anything for three days. Now that sounds great except most middle-class Americans are struggling to stay in their homes and keep their jobs. And most owner-operated retail businesses are going to take a huge financial hit from not being able to sell anything for three days. Now, the, the major multinational corporations, they work in groups. Each district, they have a district manager, and that district manager is, is responsible for, let's say, 10 stores in a district. So... Target Corporation has 10 stores in each district, and those stores, even though they're responsible for each individual, um, it, well, each individual store is responsible for their own um, money. They have to incur a certain amount of profit. They have to pay their overhead. But then that overage goes into a pool, and so the stores can float each other. Let's say that the Target across the street isn't doing so well. So after this Target pays all of their overhead, they're their overage goes into a pool and helps float all the other targets in that district. If you're an owner-operated business, you don't have that to float you. You only have your one store. And so for, for, peop- for the truckers to go and bring all of the merchandise into the retail outlets and then tell everyone not to buy anything for three days, the middle-class owner-operated mom-and-pop shops are going to take a huge financial hit. So not only does this protest support the credit card companies and the oil companies, but it attacks the middle class. And these are the people that are trying not to be on food stamps, trying to keep their businesses, trying to keep their lights on, maybe even think about buying some Christmas presents for their kids at the end of the year. But they can't do that if we're not helping them out financially. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like drinking corn syrup to protest Monsanto. (laughs) Exactly. By the bucket. (laughs) Unbelievable. All People right. have to make sure that if you're if you're protesting something that you're actually protesting it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got some things to protest over. Um, what are the terms? What do you think of the terms when you it seems to me made up like, first of all, they have the quantitative easing, which for those of you just joining us means uh, printing up a whole bunch of money on paper and throwing it out there. And they have this. Uh, shut down all based on not having enough money, which they print. I mean, we uh, weeks ago, it was just about the plan that we were going to head into Syria and launch yet another face on the war. And at the same time, didn't have enough money to put out fires on the West Coast. And now all of that is off and they can't even have people patrolling Mount Rushmore so people can look at what some real presidents might have looked like back in the day. But what are the terms debt ceiling and fiscal cliff? Uh, Who's dreaming these up? I mean, you know, I was coming up with some others like a monetary desert will be the next one. (laughs) And then next year we'll have a debt note diaspora. Uh, (laughs) That's a good one. (laughs) The spending. How about the spending down escalator? Like who, who keeps coming up with this and what does it really mean? They just create these cartoon terms. And then uh, why is it a problem in the first place? Because they're creating fear. Because uh, Obama doesn't have any money so that we have to shut down all of the uh, monuments like you mentioned. But he has enough money to hire security guards to make sure that Vietnam vets and, and World War II vets can't go into the monuments and pay homage to their fallen brethren. Then You know, it doesn't make any sense. You're absolutely right. It's all a ruse. It's fake. The money is fake. The amount of money that's out there is fake. The worth of the money is fake. So it's all fake. It's theater. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm convinced of that. I, I wish more of us could convince the others, such as the truckers and and some other people. Like It's just this uh, mirage. 
Well, I, I, I put out a video um, uh, on my broadcast yesterday on my radio show. I, I did the uh, first 15 minutes explaining to people, crunching the numbers and showing them how much money they're putting into the hands of people that they're protesting. And comments that were left on the video um, were very discouraging. Such so, as? What, what types of things were? Such as at least we're making a statement. Yes, you're making a statement. They're laughing at you while you're gassing up your cars to protest the price of gas. It's not the statement that they think. Well, at least we're doing something. Well, that's the same as telling a parent, your child might get sick. Regardless of the dangers of vaccines, the fact that they put formaldehyde and laundry detergent and and, um, live cultures of bacteria and viruses and... um, aborted fetus cells in it, you know, ignore all of that. It's better to vaccinate than to not vaccinate. That's the same logic that's being used to justify this trucker shutdown. And and that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So people are thinking that they are making a statement when they're not. They're telling the corporations and the powers that be that, yes, we will comply. If you give us a prepackaged meal, we'll eat it. Look, we've got our fork. Go ahead and give it to us. (laughs) Is this the same type of thing that the Occupy movement when it started was also, I don't want to use the word guilty of, but making the mistake of uh, standing in a certain area and being, you know, corralled by the police and, and located? I mean, they were making a statement or trying to, and I don't know what kind of, uh, if there are any long term lasting positive effects from that. Uh, Occupy movement. The Occupy movement was born out of a um, co-opted revolution that was the first one was in Serbia in the 1980s with Optor. And that was an actual grassroots nonviolent resistance. It was based on the book by Gene Sharp. And I've written an article about this on my website. And the International Republican Institute went in there. And uh, by the way, Senator John McCain is on their board. And they spoke with the leaders of Optor, and they learned how they were using nonviolent resistance to topple their government. Since then, they've taken that blueprint and spread it all over the Middle East, and we've seen it as all of the Arab Springs that have, spr- that have sprung up. And all this does is facilitate a regime change, which basically means that the guy that the U.S. government put in charge of that country is getting fired. And when that guy gets fired, he usually gets killed. It's not like he just gets a pink slip and um, some money and and gets sent home and he can go get work elsewhere. It's a very dangerous job. When you get fired, you get killed. (laughs) Such as Saddam Hussein. Uh, Yeah, he was our guy. Yeah, he was the American's boy in there from the early 60s. Yes, Batista and Castro. Yeah. And um, uh, and Noriega, um, Noriega down in Panama. And... uh, uh, Mohammed Morrissey is one of the latest that we've unseated. He only lasted a year in his position, and now we've got to get him out and put somebody else in there. We took out Gaddafi and put the National Transitional Council, which is a de facto government run by terrorists. <laughs> so. Are you aware of the uh, – there's a particular gentleman whose name escapes me, and I probably wouldn't do it justice by trying to pronounce it anyhow, who is running for the presidency of Afghanistan – a um, bit of a warlord, had ties with Osama bin Laden and uh, was driving around with a coterie of gunmen announcing that he was also going to be running uh, for the presidency of that country against, uh, I guess, I don't know if Hamid Karzai is going to have another kick at the can or whether that's going to interfere with his you know, Cal pension. But uh, it seems like nothing really has been achieved in Afghanistan other than slaughter and sadness and a lot of arms sales. Are are you familiar with the gentleman I'm speaking of and who's running no, for I'm, the presidency of Afghanistan? I'll have no, to, I'm have to... I'm not, but it that area it that's what they're they're doing. They're just absolutely like you said slaughtering and killing people and uh the the resources of that that area have been completely siphoned and and taken over by uh, corporations and, and private interests. So the people there are, are inconsequential. And so it doesn't matter, you know. That's a pretty sad statement. 
It I, is. I believe it, it is because they they do this every <laughs> you know our our president has a Nobel Peace Prize and he's droning innocent children and women every single day and that's okay. You know, we don't we we don't even think twice about the fact that we're we're just lucky we, that we're not in those countries and being slaughtered and murdered in horrible ways. And it's not just, you know, having a bomb drop and kill you. That that is something to pray for. But if you go and look at what the Free Syrian Army is doing in Syria to the people, um, it's absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine living in that area. I am very glad that I'm not in that area right now. Not that it's not coming to our country, but uh, I am so lucky that I'm not living in that area because uh, I just just recently I, I read an article about uh, this little girl who was chained to a fence watched her parents die and then they cut out her heart while she was still alive a little girl probably probably the age of my son which is about seven and this was where in syria mm -hmm. the free syrian army that we are funding to fight the proxy war al-qaeda is involved there too yeah the, those guys yeah well we set them up that's the mujahideen we set them up in the 80s in afghanistan and we've been using them ever since it's perfect because it's a war on terror who knows who's the terrorist? It could be under your bed. They could be in your closet. The duplicity. It could be your husband. <laughs> the duplicity is they're they're using Al Qaeda as as to to achieve their um, violent ends, and then at different times of the cycle, Al Qaeda is the enemy, and we're justified in spending time and money and effort in taking them out because we have to get rid of them. And then they're our friends again, and the, this is this is a created. Um, I don't know why people can't seem to see this as a very created back and forth ploy, much uh, very similar to Republicans versus Democrats. Hey, they're just uh, different faces on the same corporate power structure. As you said, everything's a corporation from the police uh, divisions or uh, different corporations, the uh, judicial system that processes criminals or people that were arrested through with the arrests. They're also corporations. And uh, so that's our cross to bear while we bomb people in other countries that don't have that luxury. Yes, that's well put. Absolutely. Let's and bring it back to let's bring it back to the United States for a second and get out of the drone uh, space for a while. Uh, you wrote a fascinating piece recently on the uh, declining consumerism of the United States that is uh, having a, a very uh, well, it's tanking the economy. What do you yes. think is going to happen on uh, – what are your predictions for the usually disgusting uh, Black Friday, which will be occurring in November? Oh, I never make predictions. But if history repeats itself, which it usually does, um, a lot of people will be standing in line for hours spending hundreds, thousands of dollars on items that they don't need with money that they don't have to buy things for people that they don't like. <laughs> but is is that a, is that a declining consumerism trend right there when people are going to be out spending as much as they can at least for that day? Well, see what what this study said and and why I wrote this article was because people are hoarding their cash and they're not putting the money into the system. They're in the 19 in, in the early 1920s, right before the crash, when Edward Bernays and the corporations and the government got together and created a desire culture out of a needs culture. That set up a whole system for planned obsolescence and for people to buy things out of excess, not because they need them, but because they want them. And people are turning back and cutting up their credit cards and spending money on only things that they need, not just on things that they want. And this has taken $3.3 .3 trillion alone in America out of the system in the global markets. So... This is huge. This means that literally if we stop spending our money in the big box stores and spend our money elsewhere, redirect the money to the local economy, to your, to your neighbors who have owner-operated businesses, if we only buy things that we need and learn how to make things and do things on our own like we used to before the crash, we will have a huge financial effect on the multinational corporations. It's not um, it, it's not the that we need to destroy the economy in, in its totality, but we need to take the money and the funding 
out of the hands of the multinational corporations. And the only way to do that is to stop feeding the system. So the, the non-compliance, the unpopular idea of non-compliance actually has a palatable effect. It's having it right now. In fact, they're saying that if this continues, if this trend continues, it could crash the global markets. That is big news. That means that we can have a real effect right now. Yeah. Well, I, I hope that that works. But with the, the news of uh, his name is Robert Fraley, the uh, chief technology officer at Monsanto, uh, getting a quarter of a million dollar cash prize, which isn't really a lot of money in Monsanto world, but it's the uh, it's the nod that counts. He, he received a, a prize for um, they, they call it the agricultural equivalent to the Nobel Peace Prize the World Food Prize given to uh, Monsanto uh, for the role of um, genetically modified crops, the creation and distribution thereof. And it's amazing to me that something that people are trying to get labeled and very much so trying to stay away from, uh, this gentleman winds up getting an award for it. How can you get an award for something that you're doing everything you can to hide its uh, proliferation on the markets? I mean, that would be like getting an Oscar for a movie that you're trying to not let anyone see. And oh, that shouldn't surprise you. They just give each other awards. I mean, why do people not realize the craziness of winning a prize for something that you're doing your best to hide from the populace? And these are little seem- things that wake me up and wake other people up, and I, I just hope it wakes a lot more people up at the same time. They have, con- they have convinced us that our freedom and our protest can benefit them. And it, it, it's the same. I'll go back to the trucker shutdown by convincing people to protest the price of gas by gassing up their car. Up is down. War is peace. That that's how they've convinced us. The reality is, and that's what we fall for. And they get us to vie for our own tyranny. Look at the, I, um, the Apple iPhone five S now, we have been hearing for a long time now about all the, meta, the metadata that the NSA is collecting from third parties, which is your cell phone company. Now they have biometric technology. They, you, scan, you scan your own fingerprint into the, the system, and that goes directly to the NSA. So now they don't have to arrest you to get your fingerprint. You're handing it over to them. And you spend, what, three, four, five, six hundred dollars $600 for this little piece of this little gadget that's really cool that is part of your shackles the reason why you are a slave that's it's perfect how they do it and it's unfortunate for people like you and me to watch it happen because it's like i slap myself on the forehead i'm like why don't people see this well i guess a lot of them are thinking well at least i'm scanning and sending in something Right. At least I'm back. You know, at least I'm you doing never know. Something. Vaccinate your kid. At least I'm doing something. <laughs> Maybe soon the phones will come with a little dose of particular vaccines and you can directly get your kid to put his thumb on the screen and the vaccine will go in through the print. Maybe they're working Oh, they out. have um, RFID chip diapers now. Okay, that I've not heard of. What What is it, that? What is <laughs> That, yeah, I wrote an article about this because I couldn't believe it. There was a startup company by two pediatricians, and it's a uh, it's an RFID chipped diaper. You can scan it with your smartphone, and it uh, monitors all of the. Uh, um, I got to be delicate here. The level all of, of the, <laughs> the waste inside the diaper. Make mm-hmm. sure that your child doesn't have a urinary tract infection. Um, that they're processing their food properly. You know. Um, and this information can also be sent directly um, to the pediatrician's database. Their computer can be – the signal can be transmitted to a computer. And so your doctor can call you up one day and say, well, you know, it looks like little Susie has a urinary tract infection. I had no idea. Well, the the RFID chip smart diaper t- let us know that there might be something wrong. You might want to bring her in. Isn't that creepy? That's creepy. <laughs> That's creepy. They'll have little voice actuated uh, terms coming out of the side. This diaper is now full enough for a congressional filibuster. <laughs> yes, call Rand Paul. <laughs> well, speaking of distractions of while all of these horrible things are going on, I wanted to speak with you about 
Uh, a couple of issues. Uh, I know it's getting a bit old now because we move along so quickly. But the Navy Yard shooter. Yes. There were um, there was a report of this Navy Yard shooting um, the day before it happened, and um, yeah, I went to Snopes, Snopes dot com, which has uh, forever been writing a, um, uh, I guess, a perception of uh, absolute perfectness as far as what they uh, do agree with and don't agree with. And I, I'm starting to find out that Snopes now has even been compromised. They said that it was partially true, mixture of truth and false, that the story came out before the Navy Yard shooter. It was uh, it was written up in a, in a Canadian newspaper in, in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia. Uh, the name of it escapes me. It's on the website. And um, and it was also a, a feed coming out of the United States happening before the shooting actually took place. Um, it's just amazing that they were able to figure that out so quickly. And I wonder what your take is on uh, Snopes. Are you familiar with Snopes? I am familiar with Snopes. Once upon a uh, time, it I... was like a Bible of truth, it seemed. And now uh, I'm getting a few more uh, things that I've been reading there that uh, don't jibe with the research that I do. Well, absolutely. See, in order to honeypot, which is uh, a lot of the purpose of most of the uh, pop culture within the main uh, alternative media, is to uproot the audience, is to find out who is listening to alternative media, um, find out whether or not they're a credible threat, what their involvement is, what they're willing to do, what they're not willing to do, who these people are. And so it, what's interesting is they, they create these scenarios where people go off on whirling dervishes all day long. For decades, they're, they're arguing over who brought down the Twin Towers and how it was brought down and what they used to bring it down. And meanwhile, while, ev- while people are trying to figure that out and arguing with each other, divide and conquer techniques are being used. And anyone who would possibly be able to organize anything that would be effective as far as a protest is, is stymied because everyone's trying to figure out, was it nanothermite? Was it a cl- controlled demolition? Was it um, energy weapons? W- you know, what was it? The point is, is that they were brought down and they were brought down for a specific purpose. And we see that purpose because look back in history, look at what happened after the Twin Towers were brought down. And so we never get to who is running the show. We never get to who is the problem. We're constantly focusing on the minutia of the details. And so we, we as a people become ineffective. And they've, they've perfected this art brilliantly. You know, it, we know that they are controlling the mainstream media. But to say that they're not controlling the alternative media is ridiculously stupid because when you look back in history, they control both sides of the war. They control both sides of every conflict. And so if they're not going to control both sides of the information, then they're not doing their job. Well, just to play devil's advocate here, isn't part of investigating whether it was nanothermite or whether there were particle beam weapons or whether it was an inside job, isn't that part of finding out who and who did it? And so then you have a better handle on stopping what they're trying to do as a result of it. Now, I realize that those movements are frequently compromised by disinfo people, agents, uh, manipulators, but uh, there must be a certain amount of people who think, who, who, who imagine if I can get to the root of this, then we can uh, blame the appropriate parties and therefore um, take appropriate action. Right. But we have to get, we have to get, a, we have to jump off from the point. Okay. The, the towers were brought down whether it was nanothermite or energy weapons to me that doesn't matter not they even if it not down. even if it leads to the identity of the culprit well has it led to the identity of the culprit no because they're constantly compromised by infighting and disinformation and so we can clearly see that the agenda of throwing out all these theories into alternative media creates a, a windstorm of people to focus in on one piece of minutia and never get to the root of the problem and see that's the point. Well, my theory on the theories is that if if someone were to figure out the exact puzzle from 
from beginning to end and were to lay it out. And it was factually, yeah, that's what happened. That's the perpetrator. That's how they did it. And they laid it out there. And it did go out on the mainstream news sources. No one would believe it anyway. Probably. The, the you, you know, know the, absolute They believe version. that mermaids are real. <laughs> they believe that that, uh, that mockumentary was real. So absolutely. They, they know what we're able to take. They know what we believe. They know what we're able, what we will fall for. They know us better than we know ourselves. So they put this out there for us to grab onto. It's, um, I, I use the example that um, they bring you to a stream and they tell you drink as much as you want. And everyone at the stream says, but this is a stream. There's not a lot of water. There's millions of people here. How can we all get a drink of water? Meanwhile, they don't tell you that over on the other side of the hill, there's a huge lake where everyone could have as much water as they want. There's an infinite amount of water on the other side of the hill. But they tell you to focus in on the stream. And that's the problem. People need to send out a search party to go over that hill and find that lake. And until we start doing that, then we're never going to get to the root of the problem Nothing's going to change. Whether or not it was nanothermite or energy weapons, the machine is still running. It's still moving forward. So obviously our knowledge of how the Twin Towers were brought down is not going to make a dent in their movement toward this complete takeover of the entire world, destroying sovereignty on every level in every nation. You mentioned earlier one thing we can do is to uh, be a little more um, uh, self-sufficient and uh, not so much rely on the corporations. And I know that several people – there are plans in certain cities uh, called urban farming where um, one gentleman will grow an incredible amount of lettuce and somebody else will grow something else and they kind of rotate the crops and they take turns caring for each other's – and this is in cities – And, of course, this is met with great resistance because you shouldn't be farming food in the cities. And uh, (laughs) it it, kind of leads down a a road of the more uh, sufficient in many ways we try to get, the more they take that away. Uh, There's some jurisdictions where the capture and use of rainwater has been drawn up on the books now as illegal, (laughs) as ridiculous as that sounds. Um, Is this all uh, uh, a filtered down version of uh, what what is often referred to and and debated as uh, Agenda 21? Well, the problem is, is that they've taken a really great idea. We all should be concerned about our planet and the effect that we're having on it. However, all the science and all the information that we have on whether or not humans are having an effect on the planet, the energy sources that we're using, the way in which we extract them, is having an effect an, or a negative effect, I should, I should clarify that, on the planet. We don't know because all the science that we have is science coming from one camp or another. See, the climate change debate is a perfect example of this because on the one side you have the uh, UN and Agenda 21 saying that humans are breathing too much, there's too much CO2 in the atmosphere, and we need to tax you and we need to lower the amount of CO2. On the other side of the camp, you have the oil companies and the Koch brothers and all those entities funding studies and information and scientific data that says that it's not human caused. So we don't know. There is no independent information to tell us what effect we're having, how negative it is, and what the long-term um, effects will be of the, the current effect that we're having right now because it's all controlled information. So we're at a standstill in the climate change debate. Whether or not people realize it, you're, you're um, supporting one side's propaganda over the other, no matter which side you stand on the climate change debate. And, and you could take that, that same philosophy and apply that to everything. It's divide and conquer. It's the, it's the reworking of the word choice. When they tell you that you can choose between Republican and Democrat, they're using the definition of option – and saying the word choice. So people forget that a choice is anything, but an option is one or the other. And so when they do this wordsmithing and this this redefining of words, we then take that up and regurgitate that and then sit on the climate change debate and say, yes, it is man-made, no, it's not. Meanwhile, the science that we're using to back our our, uh, assertion up is coming from a camp that has a monetary interest in that outcome. Yeah. Well, that is a, a big problem with the uh, 
the uh, global warming issue and the na- the climate change. They keep moving the name of it around. And uh, the, I hear this all the time. Oh, the consensus is in. There's virtually no um, – there's no argument here. But I hear arguments about it all the time. There will be arguments all the time because that's part of the – the theater of all of this that's happening is what they're looking for because as we're so used to television. We're so used to drama. We're so used to suspense. So they've taken the the fake world that Hollywood has created – and turned it into our actual reality. And by doing that, we think that real is just like in the movies. We emulate what we see when we walk out of the theater, and we help facilitate this fake reality that we live in. And we don't ever move past to see whether or not on either side of any debate, if there's any actual real truth or if it's just compromised propaganda to support that side's argument. Well, some science is rolling along, and you brought up the movies. I don't know if uh, you're aware of these uh, recent uh, onslaught of videos on the Internet from uh, DARPA or people designing robots, the uh, DARPA robots. They have them running around like uh, wild boars, and they have them. It's very much like uh, the Terminator movies that were at that time. There weren't any robots of that nature that we knew about, but now they're all happening. Oh, I've been following that. They have Atlas. Uh, they have uh, Wildcat, which is the next generation of um, of the the cheetah that they that they built uh, earlier this year. Um, Wildcat can run in an excess of almost thirty miles an hour without falling, and they're working on AI in order to imbue these robots with artificial intelligence so they can talk to the robot, tell the robot what to do, and the robot will be able to make its own decisions in order to get the function done. Now, are they going to test drive these in a, in a, the Middle East where we've invaded several countries for no uh, actual reason, or are they going to be just letting them loose to run around the streets of uh, Milwaukee and Wyoming? Well, they're, they are using um, very archaic versions. Robots are being used. Uh, the first robot, The first robots ever that were used during wartime was World War II with the Nazis. And they had a little, um, it was basically a moving landmine. Um, it was wire connected to the operator, but it was able to go, I, I think, um, several hundred feet. So, uh, I'm sorry, several hundred thousand feet so that they would be able to uh, direct it with like a joystick. And and all of our DARPA technology is based on on this apparatus that was created by the Nazis. And they are, they've used it in Afghanistan. They've used it in Iraq. These robots are are used with our uh, military to send out to places that they don't want to. Um, well, they want to make sure that the the soldiers aren't killed, and what they consider. You know, I, I thought that this was shocking when I, when I write articles about this. They say, well, you know, we want to make sure that our soldiers are safe. Oh, so wait, you're admitting that wartime kills people? <laughs> it's danger. The battlefield is dangerous. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no one said it wasn't dangerous. Yeah. Well, I, uh, yeah, some of them are incredible. They look like uh, there's one that looks like a wild boar running around at an incredible speed. And Yeah, uh, and they're able to carry about 400 pounds of equipment. They're able to go up and down uh, difficult terrain. And, um, and, and then eventually what they want to do is so that the soldier's walking with his, uh, his cheetah robot and – he tells the cheetah, okay, go ahead, go over the hill and, and kill people. And it does. And it has no empathy. It follows instructions. It's a robot, so it has a program. It has orders, and it follows it. And it, it doesn't care about whether or not it lives or dies or survives its mission. Its job is to do the mission. And and this is actually very terrifying because we're, we're always concerned about the psychopathic um, element in our culture. But here, we don't even have to put the human element or the psychopathic element into it. We can have a machine that's just following orders do that. So we don't have to worry about a, uh, um, a soldier who goes to the, to the place where he's supposed to kill people and decides that he's not going to gun down innocent women and children or innocent men who have, who have nothing to do with this just to get to their target. They can just send these robots in and get the function done. That's on a whole new level of uh, mass murder here. And and that's 
as usual, they, they use this type of technology in foreign places, but they always wind up bringing it home. Like the drones. Sure. I just sure, can't imagine yeah. <laughs> uh, some of these monster robots running around, you know, Main Street, USA, telling people, you know, you don't, your parking ticket has expired. You know, <laughs> it, it seems like it's getting completely out of control. Well, in uh, Japan, I think it is, they have robots teaching elementary school students. So they have robots who have replaced teachers there. Um, they're working on technology to make these robots look as human as possible. They have, I've reported on this, um, they have this synthetic skin that uh, they, they blow on it and it responds. It gets goosebumps. Uh, they pour water on it, uh, hot water. It responds to the heat. It responds to the cold. Um, absolutely, the idea of the Terminator is probably a, maybe a decade or two away from reality that these these robots would look just like us. If you go to the Singularity Institute and look at the uh, transhumanism movement, you'll see scientists, many scientists, who have built their own um, kind of doppelgangers, these robots that are not... Uh, they, they still have to be worked remotely. So the scientist is sitting in another room, and he's got sensors put on his face, and every time he blinks his eyes, the robot blinks its eyes. And he can speak into a microphone and, it, and the voice comes out through the uh, robot. But that's, that's huge advancements. And so if you think about it, it it's only going to be a hop, skip and a jump before the scientist can then just actually talk to his robot himself and not have to work it like a marionette on the other side of the curtain. I don't want to live here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> You're bringing me down, Suzanne. I'm sorry, no, but you I know that's why I that's why I uh, made the video about the trucker shutdown because the if we are still on this base level where we can't tell up from down and right from left, then we're in trouble, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm with Suzanne Posel, who has um, given us uh, her hour here, and she uh, she runs the show at occupycorporatism dot com, a great information source. Uh, for everybody, and um, Obama is uh, considering infinite debt to the Federal Reserve, and and I was just saying to you a, a minute ago that we seem to have money for certain things that are patently ridiculous, such as these robots and killing machines and, and all kinds of horrible things that you brought me to the base of I was on my knees there for a minute Suzanne and we have money for this and we have money to go to war and we don't have money to um, take care of seniors and particularly some of them who they've already sent out to the killing fields and inexplicably managed to come back we don't have enough money for schools and lunches not that I'm a huge school fan, but you know what I mean. I'm taking care of what needs to be taken care of at home. There's this entire ridiculous fight going on right now in the United States about not having enough money. And at the same time, they're waging war. At the same time they're doing this, they're shutting down the government to the point where I don't know what's happening. People are setting themselves on fire. Somebody self-immolated in uh, the D.C., region just a day or two after another unfortunate woman drove her car around frenetically and was killed by a bunch of police officers who apparently haven't watched any movies where you shoot the tires and then the car can't drive. But they somehow decided, hey, you know what, we'll take the baby out of the car and we'll kill the woman. And later on, our striking congressional uh, representatives will give us a standing ovation in the House. I mean, what madness. How how are we uh how are we set for the future with these kinds of things going on? Well, let, let's let's uh analyze the capital shooting because I put out um an article that went viral and it should and it should continue to go viral because there are facts about that shooting that no one is talking about. And I put out a video on YouTube and um the the company that put out the raw footage, Alhura TV. Uh, this is public domain information. And I used it in a video on YouTube. 
and they have uh, in, uh, put up a copyright infringement notice because of the information that I put on, you know, in the audio on top of the footage. I noticed some things right off the bat about this that didn't make any sense. When they picked out Miriam Carey to use as the person driving the car, they all admitted, and I read about 75, 76 articles about the shooting when it first happened, and every source admitted that Miriam Carey came from anonymous sources, came from anonymous law enforcement sources. They believed that this was the person. In fact, they went on Facebook and took a picture of someone who matched the description of uh, Miriam Carey from anonymous sources. So whether or not Miriam Carey was driving the car is hugely important because if she wasn't driving that car, then poor Miriam Carey has passed away and we don't know why. Now, I find it interesting that her family members were called to view the body and identify the body. And when they got there, the uh, officers did not let them actually see the body. They showed them a picture. Well, that's so, uh, the, the the thing that I noticed when I watched the Al Hura video and, and uh, some other folks there that apparently were citizens with uh, handheld cameras was that uh, I don't know if it was the lighting or the tinted windows or if there were tinted windows, but I couldn't see anyone driving the car. Absolutely. I pointed that out. I pointed out the fact that no one could see whether or not it was male or female, how old this person was. The other thing is, and, and I can say this because I have two small children and I, and I have a driver's license. I drive my car. Um, whoever was driving that car was not a scared 34-year-old woman with her baby in the backseat. This person did a three-point turn when surrounded by four police vehicles, five officers with guns drawn ready to shoot, and this person was able to do a three-point turn and almost run over two officers to get away. That's not the act of a scared, confused, uh, because of a drill that was going on simultaneously, 34-year-old dental hygienist with her baby screaming in the back seat. This was not the act of a confused woman. Whoever was driving that car was intent on getting away. And then again, I don't understand why the police at one point, there's a, a section in the video where the car is surround, the car's not moving and it's surrounded by several police and they've all got guns drawn apparently on the interior of the car and no one's busy shooting out the tires like you do when yeah. you don't want a car to drive. Exactly. And then the car gets away. Like, and then, exactly. th- and then those cops get an uh, applause break from the uh, the uh, senator from the from the congressional from the house. That was insane, right? And people are because championing whoever this. Was, whoever was driving that car was not Miriam Carey. It was not Miriam Carey. But whoever was driving that car, obviously, Congress was really happy that that person is no longer with us. Um, another fact that n- that nobody brought up was nobody decided to look and see who Al Hora TV is. And when I went to see who they are, I found out some interesting facts. Who is Al Hora are- TV? Al Hora TV is a broadcasting outlet that is a propaganda machine funded by um, the Broadcasting Board of Governors. They have correspondence in the State Department, the White House, Congress, and the Pentagon. And they bring propaganda to the Middle East about their own region, the world, and the United States, supporting democratic values and using their propaganda platform to expound those democratic values onto the Middle Eastern nations. That sounds like the Voice of America or Radio Free America. Yes, (laughs) exactly. But the video version. On the Board of Governors, we have um, a gentleman who is the current president of NBC Universal International, John Kerry. Susan McHugh, who is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and a gentleman who served in two senior roles um, for multiple senators, two presidential campaigns, and served two uh, U.S. House offices and um, helped congressional campaigns in 25 states. Oh, and, 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 and an ambassador to the U.S. for Afghanistan from 2011 to 2012. So my question is, who was actually driving that car? Who did they murder? And why do they have uh, Miriam Carey's baby 
in CPS custody? Why are they not allowing the family to view the body? The family also made statements that Miriam Carey was not on psychotropic drugs. She was not schizophrenic. She had taken um, many years ago antidepressants, but she was not currently on antidepressants. That whole theater, when they went into her apartment and found all of this evidence, like, like anyone in their right mind has all of their paperwork strewn all over their house waiting for somebody to find. It, usually people have file cabinets and they put their stuff away. No, this woman had everything all over the place, pill bottles everywhere, uh, documents showing that she was schizophrenic. It's just perfect. Mm. And and taking into the fact that they believed from the get-go from anonymous sources that this was Miriam Carey, they went on Facebook and found a picture based on the information they got from these anonymous sources. Miriam Carey, whatever happened to that poor woman, she had nothing to do with this, uh, this scene that we saw in D.C., and it had nothing to do with a simultaneous drill. I I personally think that uh, they went to go kill someone and that person got in their car and drove away. And it be, what was meant to be a private um, assassination ended up being public. And they had to come up with a cover story. So they went online and they found a picture of Miriam Carey. And they made sure that this would fit the official story. It would be believable. And so they murdered Miriam Carey. And... Um, now, it doesn't matter who was driving that car because people like you and me who go and look at Al Hura TV and go and look to see what's actually going on becomes inconsequential. The official story is Miriam Carey. And even in alternative circles, they're still talking about Miriam Carey. So you see how this works? It doesn't matter. Hmm. Well, it does matter. And I hope that people will uh, start to put more of these pieces together and uh, that they do their own research. I commend uh, anyone... I command everyone, I should say, <laughs> to uh, visit Suzanne Posel's very informative website. It is OccupyCorporatism.com. I've been speaking with Suzanne Posel for the last hour or most of it. Suzanne, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, keep Absolutely. Doing, thank you. Keep doing what you do, and, and we hope to have you back again sometime. Absolutely. I had a great time. Thank also, you. please throw out your, uh, you mentioned it several times, your YouTube channel. Were you posting? Oh, yes. Well, I uh, I just started. I had a radio show on American Freedom Radio, and I, I just started a new radio show. It's called Hardline with Suzanne Posel. Um, when you go to Occupy Corporatism, you can click on the Hardline Radio page, and it'll take you to the YouTube channel. Um, I broadcast live Tuesdays and Thursdays, 1 to 3 Pacific time on iHeartRadio. So I'm very excited because I have a bigger audience and I get to bring this information to people who may not have even considered these options. Well, I hope you choices. I hope you get letters <laughs> from them because they're the really fun ones to read. <laughs> Trust me. I, they, I I have two email accounts, one for everyone else and and one for people that I actually know. Um, and, and and it is very interesting the the emails that I get and the hate mail that I get. It is quite interesting. Well, you must be doing something <laughs> right. Uh Everyone, head over to Suzanne Posel's site and and learn a few things. Suzanne, it's been great speaking with you, and I'm glad that you're out there. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Please offer comments or complaints by emailing conspiracyqueries at gmail.com or on Twitter at con underscore queries or at our website, conspiracyqueries.com. Thanks for listening.